Thanks for coming to today's session. My name is Megan. I'm the GIS and Data Viz Librarian at the University of Manitoba. And today I'm going to be talking about open visualization tools. So before I started at the University of Manitoba, in my previous life, I worked as a GIS analyst uh, and I freelanced. So to keep my overheads low, what I ended up doing was just adopting a lot of open tools. Um, and so now that I work in academia, I've tried to kind of carry that on, on through, uh, through what I do just to give people the option of using tools that aren't proprietary software. And so I'm going to talk about those tools in terms of relating them back to your research process today. If you want to follow along with the slides, you can find them at the bit.ly link that's on the screen. Um, bit.ly slash OSS underscore W2021. Um, all of the blue links are clickable for you, so you can go and see what it is I'm talking about yourselves and explore at your leisure. So three main goals that what I want you to get you guys out of today's session. The first is that you gain familiarity with open visualization tools and what is supported through the university or through me. Uh, identify types of structured data sets and appropriate tools to use for each. And finally, what the majority of the session is going to be spent on is evaluating different presentation scenarios and exploring open tools for each of them. How we're going to get there. The first is I'm going to give my def definition of what an open tool is, um, discuss the University of Manitoba library resources that can support you in this, identify key points of self-assessment for tool selection, and finally explore tools for use at different points in the research life cycle. I've set aside a chunk of time at the end for questions, so you guys can ask your questions at the end. Or if you come up with anything throughout the session, just drop it in the chat box and I can address them at the end. So what do we mean by open visualization tools? There are kind of two streams to think about. The first one is, are tools that are created using an open development process and they're licensed to be made freely available for possible modification and redistribution. So it doesn't matter if you are doing profit generating work or if you're using it for research and education, anybody and everybody can use the tools for whatever purpose and also modify them. We'll also be discussing some proprietary software, so licensed software that has a free tier associated with it. Uh, some people call that dis open. It's not like pure open, but it is openly available. They are tools that are openly available for you to visualize your data with. So if you're at that point where you're just trying to think to yourself, okay, cool, open tools, um, where do I even, how can I even get started in all of this? The first place would be, I would suggest, would be the data visualization libguide. Uh, or subject guide. I'll go through it in a bit later. And then to think about training resources. So training resources being workshops that are offered through libraries, but also um, resources that can be accessed through the library catalog. So if you are trying to get, get to a point where you're just getting started, um, and you're not trying to solve one specific problem, you're just like, what is R? And how might I use it? Or what is, what is ESRI? What is ArcGIS? Using library resources is a great way to figure out, um, to figure out just kind of like the scope of what people are doing with uh, these different tools. In terms of workshops that are offered, this is just kind of a snippet of what I offered in the fall and winter semester. So basic introduction to data visualization, some open data sets, um, QGIS, so open source GIS software, some proprietary solutions, um, and moving forward, what I'm hoping is that I'll be able to offer 
more open tool workshops if people express interest in them. So it's just one of those things that my position is a new one and I don't really know what it is people want. So that would also be something that would be helpful for me is if in the follow-up survey or in the chat you can tell me about sessions that you would like to see or problems that you're trying to solve. Um, and then I can suggest tools and offer sessions that can support you in that. Oh, and all of those sessions can be found on the main page of the library website. There is a calendar, and in that calendar you can click on the sessions, and it takes you to the uh, enrollment page. Also, if you are in one of my uh, slide decks, the, all of these blue links will link you into uh, the login pages as well. So the first thing we're going to talk about are data types. And the concept of data can be something that is surprisingly, or for me, surprisingly contentious in that often I will go into, a, I'll go into sessions and where I'm teaching a tool and I start by talking about like what sort of data do you have. Uh, and different researchers don't like to think about their research outputs as data. They prefer to think of it as, um, as, a, as a research output. So for me, when I discuss data, what I mean is some kind of an output that, has, that you have collected that you're looking to visualize. And when I call it structured data, all that I mean is that it is data that is organized in such a way that a visualization tool can ingest it. Um, so that being header, like you putting headers in, using consistent words throughout, um, and using file formats that these visualization softwares can actually ingest. Um, those are things that are just plain old critical to using data visualization tools. doesn't matter what you call it, um, but you need some sort of data or some sort of an input that is structured in a specific way. So there are three main types of data or input that visualization software can deal with. The first is our tabular or textual data. So think of that as like your CSV files, your Excel sheets, um, all of those kinds of things. The next is vector data. The most popular type of vector data it would be your shape files in terms of geospatial data. So these are files that have um, pairs of latitude, longitude, x and y coordinates that are either points, lines, or areas. And then you're doing statistical analyses on these different data types to show relationships or descriptive statistics, things like this. The final data type would be raster data. So this can be anything from a scan of an, Im a scan of an image, a scan of a piece of art, um, some kind of a surface of a flow diagram, or, um, or a map that's been scanned. So there the image is being depicted with pixels, not with lines. And all of these different data types are also um, kind of can be converted one to the other in that what their text files will be your most stable format. So if you are looking to archive a raster data set or a vector data set um, and put it away for a while, then what you can do is kind of revert it back to its original state of a CSV file and then you don't have to worry about it degrading over time. So all things to think about when you're preserving your data or you're looking at moving forward with data, using kind of the simplest, uh, most stable format is going to make your life easier. So when you are looking at tabular data, that would be a CSV file over an Excel spreadsheet. Um, for vector data, that's a shape file or an SVG file. And for raster, it's anything that is a lossless format. So JPEGs degrade over time depending on how many times you use them. Something like a PNG image is more stable. 
So now that we've talked about data formats, some tool considerations. When people come and talk to me, what I like to get them to do before they jump in and learn a tool is to kind of step back and think to themselves, okay, what is my message? And some people say, well, I did all this awesome science and what I want to, I just want people to be able to explore and I want people to be able to see everything. And while that might be how you feel, how you feel in your heart of hearts, um, what you what you end up, what ends up being easier for your audience is if you direct them a little bit, if you give them context, a bit of context, and even if it's putting your research question in there, putting your deciding that you are going to use plain language to describe your headings, things like just simple things like that, where you are distilling the most important parts of your research and, um, and not blinding people with science. That leads in to our audience section where what you want to do is step back and think to yourself, okay, I have this thing, uh, I have this project, and I need to explain it to somebody. That somebody might be um, a publication board or an editorial board at, in a, for a journal. It might be the audience of a, new, of a news show or a program. It might be the people who are watching, paying attention to your Twitter, um, or it might be your advisor. And so thinking who that audience is, um, and then deciding, okay, what language is it that they are going to be most comfortable with? Should I be using a lot of jargon, or should I be using plain language? What media is it that they are going to be able to best um, ingest in that if you are bringing your research up to a northern community that you had done interviews on or something and you're, you've gone up to show, show them your research output, um, if Wi-Fi or internet isn't stable, having built them a massive data dashboard where that requires high bandwidth, that's not going to be the best solution for you. Something in paper will probably be more useful. So thinking, okay, what can people actually make use of? Because you want your research to be useful. Um, and thinking, okay, this makes a lot of sense. So figuring out the simplest way to get your message across, so that thinking about things like, do I need a bunch of pop-ups, or will pop-ups be redundant? If something is going to be printed out at the end of the day, um, do, do I need to consider um, do I need to consider color a little bit more? Like, if it's cheaper for people to print in black and white, will they take this lovely map that I've created, uh, spent all this time selecting colors on, and just print it out in grayscale 150 times? So just thinking about things like that when you're doing your selecting, also in terms of accessibility, if colorblindness is something that you're taking into consideration, so not only using color to, um, to depict your data values, Lots of different things to think about. The next thing when you're considering a tool would be your data requirements and your data structure. So we'll start with structure. Um, depending on what your data physically looks like, that will kind of dictate what tool you want to take it into and how much time you have to massage it into a different format. So thinking about, OK, if I have the CSV file, what am I going to do? How am I going to ground it? Am I going to ground it in time, so kind of link everything around the idea of time? Or am I going to link it to geography and use some kind of a map or some kind of a location cue to get people to see what's going on? So thinking about the data structure and how the software is going to interact with it, that's important. The next is just the requirements of the data. So if you've submitted ethics and have some kind of a data management plan, there will be a part in there that talks about, uh, that talks about data residency. And data residency, a lot of people just think of it in terms of data preservation. So once you've finished your research project, you're going to put your data in Dataverse, and it's just going to hang out there um, for, for the future. But 
in terms of data residency, we're also thinking about um, the tools that we're using to analyze our data. So some of the tools that we'll look at today are tools that are, that are desktop software. And so if your data residency requirement is such that your data only lives on University of Manitoba servers or only lives on a locally hosted machine, um, then you're good for desktop software. But if it says, if you're thinking, oh, this, I don't know, ArcGIS, no, I guess ArcGIS Online is not open. Um, Leaflet looks great, or um, Data Wrapper looks like a great tool for you. Those tools are cl use cloud processing, and so your data is no longer living on University of Manitoba servers or on your local desktop. You've loaded it somewhere else. And so by loading it somewhere else, you've broken your data residency requirements. Um, so thinking about where your data needs to live while you do your analysis um, is also important. And then the last point is to be kind to your future self. So people can get really excited about vis the visualizing part, but you're also trying to finish, finish a thesis or you ha you're working or you've just got a bunch of stuff going on. And what I like to say to people is step back and think, okay, while this open tool is really cool, um, or while this proprietary tool is really cool, is it in my best interest to try and learn it if it's only gonna be worth 2% of my mark? Or if I'm only going, it's only going to be a tiny little 300 by 300 pixel image. Do I need to go and learn this crazy tool? Or can I make a chart, a map, a graph, whatever, in um, using Google Earth, using PowerPoint, and take a screenshot of it? Um, so thinking to yourself, what is the best, what's the best way to use my time? And what's in, what is important at the end of the day? Technology is real cool, but you don't want to stress yourself out about it. It's supposed to help you, um, not give you a bunch of stress. So now we're getting into all of these different tools and what instead of focusing on different parts of the data analytics cycle, what I'm going to do instead is focus on different points of the research cycle and where different tools and initiatives might come in. So our first area would be our data collection phase. And so we're thinking of, we've gone out, we've collected our data, and now we just need to do things like share it with an advisor um, and just talk about it a little more. So be able to simply visualize it and contextualize it. The analysis part, we're not going to talk about as much today. Um, and then there's the part that everybody thinks about in terms of visualizing is at the research output phase when you want to visualize all of the research you've done and share it with your peers and share it with the public. So if we are looking at contextualizing our initial research or even our final research, giving context using secondary data sets, be it geospatial data or other data sets, is going to be critical to help people understand what it is that you've got going on. So if you have gone, went to other sessions in the Open Science series, you would have heard from Grace, you would have heard from Cody, who talked about open, uh, open data platforms, open government data. Uh, so I'm going to try and focus kind of on the other side of that, which is open data sets that aren't created by government. So a good geospatial one to get started with is OpenStreetMap. And you can think of OpenStreetMap as um, as the Wikipedia of Google Maps. Just a second, I'm going to relocate the cat. And so with it, what it's great, what's really great about it is it is a publicly created um, basically map of the entire world where people update, um, add their end, add things about their local neighborhoods. As this initiative has grown over time, more and more people have bought into it. So if we zoom out and we go back over to like Riding Mountain National Park, 
Parks Canada has actually bought into the, this idea and the usefulness of it, and they've gone in and updated areas around um, around around Riding Mountain National Park. So making sure that all of the roads are accurate, boundaries are accurate, things like this. The other thing that's great about OpenStreetMap is um, for a lot of times emergency response like Red Cross uses it um, and will update areas in more remote communities. And so you might find if you're looking for geographic data of a more remote community, you might find that it's more up to date um, in OpenStreetMap. So you can update it yourself by getting an account and also download the data um, all of this vector data onto your own computer. And like we saw with um, when we were zoomed in closer to Winnipeg, it has a really high degree of accuracy. You can see that somebody's gone in and digitized not all of, but most of the buildings um, in suburban area. There are different nights sometimes um, that Red Cross runs where you can get together online. Um, and they'll just pick an area that needs to be updated in somewhere, anywhere in the world for emergency reasons, so like hurricane relief or something like that, and then everybody just kind of references uh, base maps and goes and updates maps. So that's a thing that happens. What you can also do, uh, or what people also do, is they're not in OpenStreetMap, but in other uh, with other interest groups is if you can think of anybody who might have an interest in an area that is big enough that um, that there's some kind of a web presence for it, there's probably a CSV file somewhere on their site associated with it. So if we think of something like eBird, it's a community of um, it's a community of birders. And so people go around and they share their sightings of different birds in the world. You can track, create your own list, track your list, and then you can share them. And so if you're looking for bird data, what you can do is go and download the CSV file of all of the bird sightings in an area. Same sort of thing with people who are interested in uh, flight, plats, flight paths of airplanes. So if FlightAware is a site that um, you can go on and if you look up in the sky and you see a plane going overhead, um, it's probably going to be on FlightAware and you can see all sorts of information associated with all of these different aircraft, so like their paths, what time of day it is, um, where they're going, all of those things. You can find CSV data and download it as well. So just like thinking about these different um, interests and areas that people might have, there's just so much data out there. There's probably going to be a CSV file somewhere um, that's useful for you. So that is, yeah, so you'd be able to get access to all of that flight activity log, things like that. So that is your secondary data. Now if we look at, if we go to the data visualization guide, so this is the subject guide that I have for data visualization. You can find it under the rest of the subject guides on the library website. Um, just search for data visualization or search data visualization on the main page of the library website and this guide will come up. So if we go to the tools section, I've created a list of tools that I can support you with. Um, it's a mix of open tools and proprietary tools, and we're going to go through a couple of them today. So I'm going to start at the top with accessibility tools. Uh, so two main ones to think about are is Cobliss, which is the colorblind sim simulator. It's also great for if you're wondering what your graphic is going to look like um, if somebody photocopies it and does it and looks at it in black and white. So if I open that one up, they've got an image loaded in there, but you can load your own image by going to Browse, 
Um, I have an image. I have a lot of images saved on my desktop, but we're going to use this one. So this is just a screenshot out of OpenStreetMap that we looked at before. So this is what it would look like to just like the normal eye that someone not experiencing color blindness. Then if they are red weak, we can click on that and see how your graphic changes. Or if they are red blind, we can see how the graphic changes again for blue blind. And so it's this idea of remembering that different people will be perceiving your graphics differently. Um, and so chart, map, graph, it doesn't matter. If you're only using color to depict your data, there will probably, there's a good chance that there will be somebody who's missing out on a lot of what you're trying to get across. So using things like line weight and text um, labels, that will help your user. I'm also in two weeks time running a session called Data Visualization, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And what it talks about there is making good decisions um, in your per data visualization. Then if we're wondering what our map would look like in black and white, we can look at the monochromacy option. And then we can see how that map's changed. So another place that is really useful is matplotlib and so that's from it's a python um a python library but what i really like about it um, i'm not going to make talk about python with you today is looking at how these different color ramps and these different color selections are going to look when you convert them to um to grayscale so you can see something like this, where's a good one, or where's a bad one? Um, something like this reds ramp, when you look at the color, you, when you look at it in color, you can see, oh yeah, that goes from light to dark, and it's fairly easy to distinguish. But when you look at it in grayscale, you lose, um, you lose a, lot of, a lot of that detail especially with the diversion color, color ramps. So if you're using one of the standard color palettes um, in QGIS or ArcGIS um, or even, um, even in Excel or a spreadsheet software, you can see the difference between the two, the left and the right side. Somebody's not going to be able to distinguish between those two colors um, if, if your graphic is changed to black and white. And then it just goes into some qualitative color ramps. And I think it's pretty cool. Where are we? Right. So that was Cobliss. Color Brewer is a great tool for helping you pick your colors. And it will open in a new tab. So you can select how many classes you've got, if your data is sequential diverging or qualitative, if you want it to be colorblind safe, print friendly, photocopy safe, and then it will select color ramps for you. Um, so that's a great way to help you with your color selection. Then we've got all these different visualization tools. So if I start at the top um, under with Data Wrapper, what I really like about Data Wrapper is it has a free tier um, that you can have a certain number of graphics with a certain number of views for each. That as students you will definitely you won't you won't have to worry about hitting that. Um, so you can create charts. And what I really like about Data Wrapper is how um, how clear their annotations are, and all just all the different annotation options that allow you to kind of focus the reader on what it is you want them to want them to see. And so you can load your data, create a graphic, style it, 
um, or they've got different templates and things that you can say, I would like to make a line graph that looks something like this. Um, then you load your own data in and kind of massage those templates based on that. These are a lot more editorial looking, but they are still, it's still a great, um, it's still a great option. Uh, we have our maps. Same sort of idea. And you can see that just the pop-ups are very nicely formatted without a lot of hand coding on your, from your end. And the last thing is my favorite part of Data Wrapper are the tables. Uh, you can just create some really nice looking tables really quickly and um, that are searchable, interactive. You've got graphs inserted right into them. Um, and you can just create visual tables quite easily. So that's Data Wrapper. Where am I? The problem with having things embedded in my slides is sometimes I get lost. So that's Data Wrapper. Gephi is a great place to start if you are doing network, network visualization. I'm going to be offering a session on it in the summer. So looking at how different elements of research or some kind of a data set are related to one another. And so you can create these network visualizations. Um, it's an open platform. Google. Why I want to bring Google up is that, yes, it is, yes, it is free to access. But um, at the end of the day, Google wants to make a profit and, or needs to make a profit to stay, to stay relevant. And so what I see a lot of is students who have started out with their with their data in Google Sheets and they're looking for an easy way to geocode or an easy way to format and Google's great at selecting different tools at having different tools available to you so you load your data up you visualize it on and you go to visualize it on a map and it says hey you can use our geocoder and that's going to make your life really easy for positioning your postal code data and that is all good and well until you want to actively export it and use it into an, in another software. Um, and but what happens then is Google will end up saying to you, well, you know, you need if you want that to take that data out with all that value added information, what you need to do is buy an API key from us um, so you can so you can get access to it. So recognize that Google is free to an extent, but once you start using their more in-depth tools, um, that they, they, will, they, will want to, they will want to make money off of you. So don't get in too deep because kind of that process of stepping back, getting your data back out of, um, out of a Google format and into something that can be ingested by, um, by something like QGIS is, which it's a bit of a sad waste of time if you're kind of on a timeline and you're a little bit stressed out. Uh, raw graphs is our next one, and it kind of talks about itself as the missing link between spreadsheets and data visualization. Um, if you just need one slide with some kind of a fancy graphic graphic on it, um, it's great. You can make pretty easily make really lovely. Um, really lovely graphics. They have their uh, they have their gallery that you can look at, and yeah, it has a bit of a steeper learning curve than Data Wrapper, but it it makes nice things and it is open. And one more back, two more back. Yes. Then we have our infographics tools. So if you're looking to create an infographic, there are tons and tons and tons of different resources on the internet for, with a free tier for creating infographics. The thing with them is that you, um, you'll, you will either be able to export only in one format or they'll put a big old logo on top of it. Um, just lots of different things in that way. So PictoChart and Visme are two 
good entry-level tools that allow you to export and share um, using, using their free tools. You can look at their templates. I also have a session with a walkthrough in it that's posted onto my in my workshops if you wanted to figure out how to create your own infographics using PictoChart. Then in terms of our, I'm going to lump maps and statistical software into the same group. We're not really talking about them today. So QGIS and GrassGIS are two, uh, two open source um, GIS tools that are widely used, have robust and robust communities of support. It's what I use when I freelance. Um, and it has the, most of the functionality that the Esri software has. Um, and if you're looking for an alternative to SPSS, um, PS, PSPP, it would be your option there. Then we have our graphic design tools. And I've been getting a lot more questions about these in the last, I'm going to say, since right before Christmas. And so if you're thinking about, if you are going to be making a lot of different infographics or things like that, like what for me, if I'm creating these things, I'm probably not going to be using an infographic builder. I'm just going to draw it myself in Inkscape. So Inkscape is the would be the equivalent to Adobe Illustrator. GIMP is your equivalent to Photoshop. And then Scribus is your equivalent to InDesign. And if I close this window, okay, so if we look at a map, um, just to make this a little bit more clear. So the map itself, so think of the points and lines and areas, that would be what would be created in your vector graphics software like Adobe Illustrator or like um, Inkscape. Then once you have created that map, you're going to want to scale it and kind of like maybe change the saturation of the colors or something like that all in, the simple, in a certain way. And that would be when you would bring it into Photoshop to kind of make those tweaks to the background image. And then when would you want to use InDesign? Your InDesign um, or your Scribus is your layout edi editor. So that would be like putting these frames and neat lines around things, putting stacking different maps on top of each other, adding these annotations around. And so it's like it's a package using those um, those three tools together gives you a really great graphic design stack that is completely open source and way, way, way cheap. Well, not cheap, it is cheaper, it's free um, compared to the Adobe, uh, the Adobe suite of tools. And then our last section is our programming section. And so if you are the sort of person who you want to create visualizations, and but you are already doing your analysis in, say, Python or R, um, or you're really comfortable with JavaScript, then there are a lot of different tools that you can use um, and libraries that you can build into your um, you can build into your resources that will do that visualization piece for you. So if we're looking at Leaflet and Mapbox, I don't know about Leaflet these days, so. Um, why, and why I say that is, so Leaflet is an open source JavaScript library for creating, for creating maps. So everything from putting, creating like very simple maps and placing a point, putting pop-ups, changing base maps, things like that. Um, robust community of users, really great documentation on many different things, uh, on many different things that you might want to do. And then Mapbox is a library that is built on top of Leaflet. So if you, if you want to kind of use, create resources that have a Mapbox flavor of Leaflet, so uh, pop-ups and things formatted in a certain way, 
um, different transformations, global, global switches, um, slightly, I guess, more, a little bit more vigorous with uh, or in-depth with analysis, um, then you would add your map box on top of your leaflet to get access to those different plugins and things. Um, once again, documentation is really awesome. It's all open. It's all open. So there are code samples that you can work with. Um, you paste your own token in, and you can figure out uh, what it's going to look like. There's a robust community of users that can help you. Uh, but yeah, Leaflet has recently been acquired by Esri, um, and I don't know if what's going to happen there. If it's going to just be Esri flavored Leaflet, and then like there will just be a subset of leaflet kind of actions and things that ESRI or ESRI is going to make use of, or if eventually they will get swallowed up by the giant machine that, corporate machine that is ESRI. Um, so I guess all we have to do is wait for that. And then the last one is Timeline JS. So if you're looking at creating interactive timelines, there are tons of different tools for it. Um, this one is a JavaScript library that allows you to kind of ground the user in time. Um, also embed things like video, and there's a map somewhere along here in a timeline that you can walk a user through, um, that you can walk, walk a user through a specific, um, a specific topic. So there are many more tools than what I've brought up here in terms of the programming world, but these are ones that I can support you with um, while you're trying to visualize your data. Then daily tasks, sort of out of scope, but still relevant, I think still relevant. Um, so because I am the person that I am, I am, I really, believe in the value of open tools um, for a whole, a whole range of reasons. One, if you are freelancing or you just don't have a lot of money that you want to put towards buying software, um, keeps your overhead low. But also just the community of practice that surrounds it. So there are only two data visualization librarians in Canada. I'm one of them. The other one's at U of T. And then there's a couple of down in this couple of us down in this or a couple of us down in the States. Um, and so by using open tools, what we can do is share the resources that we do create. So instead of everybody building on their own, um, they can, we can share and we can modify and we can let each other know what we've been doing um, with our resources. So in terms of Office applications, what do I use? LibreOffice. So it ha that's like your word processing software, your spreadsheets, things like that. All of my slides I build in Reveal. Um, and so like this slide deck is living on GitHub right now and the slide background um, each it's kind of split up in sections and you just tell it what um, you tell it what you want to see. I really like it because I hate PowerPoint and this gives me complete control to keep things simple. Um, I can call on different emoji libraries or image libraries to kind of liven up my slides a little bit or create an interactive graphics on my slides, um, which is something I like to do. And then in terms of web hosting and creating, um, creating content for creating content and putting it somewhere, libraries uses those subject guides that you're all familiar with, hopefully, maybe, maybe not, it's fine. Um, and while it's great to have these proprietary systems, um, they aren't easy to archive. And if when things, when versions change, it just gets very, I guess, exhausting um, to just constantly up, have to update your materials um, to reflect whatever the new formatting changes are. And it's completely out of your control. So for my workshop content, I use GitHub. Um, a combination of GitHub and Git Pages. And so all of my workshops can be found um, here. 
And here, where is the pictochart one? The infographics one is, if you're looking for it, you can create your account, download your data, um, and then walk through that exercise. It's also posted on YouTube. And so just being able to kind of create your own very simple um, static page that links all of these different tools together. So my slides, I can embed them into, um, into my workshop very easily. And then my colleagues at other institutions can grab, where can I go? We view the page in GitHub. Um, they can go in and say, oh, I just want that, um, that PictoChart session they can go in and say, I would like to download this folder. They add it to their, uh, they add it to their own library, and um, they can see what updates I've been making. That also helps me stay organized, and they can reuse it, and I can see who's doing what when as well. Um, so yeah, just a bunch of different tools that, um, that make my life easier, and hopefully, um, and hopefully make other people's lives easier instead of other everybody just kind of working away in their own um, in their own little bubbles. So we've got a couple minutes left. If you've got any questions or there are things that you would like um, or there are things that you would like workshops on in the future, um, drop it in the chat and. I can respond to it or send me an email, let me know in the follow-up session, 